The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Essential Conversations for HCC, Radiology-Oncology Collaboration and Immunotherapy Advances in Intermediate and Advanced Disease. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash WEZ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Uh, good evening. And welcome to Essential Conversations for Hepatocellular Carcinoma. My name is Riyadh Salem, and I'm uh, thrilled to be joined by Mark Yarshwin from Johns Hopkins. So our goals for tonight are to provide you with updates on the evidence supporting immunotherapy-based platforms in HCC, including in advanced and intermediate disease settings. We want to offer guidance on integrating immunotherapy platforms into the team-based multidisciplinary management of intermediate and advanced HCC. And finally, we want to equip you to address practical safety, care consideration, and therapy delivery considerations when treating HCC patients using a variety of treatment modalities. So let's start with the scope of the problem. Despite advances in treatment and diagnosis, HCC mortality in the United States is increasing. And as you can see here from a report from two years ago, these continue to increase. The death rate in HCC continues to increase. If you project about seven to 10 years, irrespective of the category, death rates continue to, incre uh, to increase with the exception of the Asian patient population. In reality, the basis of this presentation and the discussion tonight is that modern HCC care is a multidisciplinary, dynamic, and very collaborative um, uh, relationship and process. The tumor board, the discussion with all the team members is really essential in improving patient outcomes. And here you can see from a report from our group that shows that the HCC patient is managed and, and uh, discussed by multiple modalities, including uh, oncology, hepatology, surgery, radiology. And from there, from that discussion, the patient migrates from, from treatment to treatment and specialty to specialty to optimize long-term outcomes. One of the major advancements over the last 20 years has been the characterization of HCC in the cirrhotic liver by using the BCLC staging system. And by providing prognostic factors, like tumor burden, like liver function, like performance status, patients can be categorized into um, categories that essentially give you long-term outcomes. And looking at characteristics, you start to identify the first best treatment option. In brief, very early or early patients are treated with potentially curative options like ablation or resection or transplantation. Moving on to the more intermediate stage now, this is where patients are now cat categorized into three uh, uh, areas, uh, some that can be treated with downstaging categories, with local regional therapies, and some that are approaching the advanced patient population that are best treated with systemic therapies. And of course, the area of most rapid advancement over the last 10 years is in systemic therapies for the advanced patient setting, and this is something that Mark and I will be discussing tonight. New to the algorithm this year is the individualized patient care concept where while looking at the best first treatment option is the way to go, individualized patient decision-making as a team, as a group, as a collaborative um, uh, multidisciplinary setting is how patient decision-making is ultimately made. And you can see here the addition of clinical decision-making in the BCLC schema, where now in the early setting, local regional therapies like chemoembolization or radioembolization have been added with treatment migration, of course. And then, of course, the, the area of most advancement in the last 10 years in the advanced settings, things that Mark will be discussing a little bit later on, the immunotherapies, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, et cetera, those treatments that are now used in first and second and even third line settings. Despite these advancements, there still needs to be more work. And many patients, in fact, go untreated. One report a few years ago talked about nearly 600 patients with almost 50% of patients not receiving any active first-line therapy. Now, there could be a lot of reasons for this, but information and knowledge could be one of them. There are also patients in the more earlier settings, that is, that is intermediate and early advanced patients, that were also reported to also receive no active treatment when first diagnosed. So this is a problem. Education is important. Knowledge of this disease condition is important. And the usual trope that HCC patients don't do well is no longer true. 
The last 20 years or so have shown significant advancement in HCC, and this, these statistics are no longer acceptable given the treatment options that Mark and I and others currently have. And finally, as I mentioned before, everything is based and centered on the multidisciplinary team for management of HCC. The medical oncologist, the hepatologist, the pathologist, the interventional radiologist, transplant surgeons, the nursing staff, all of these patients are essential. And there have been a lot of studies that have published that have shown that when these teams work together, survival improves and the best option is selected for the patient at the right time. And this is something that has been shown over and over in multiple settings to improve overall survival. So let's now shift over and start talking about collaborative strategies for innovative immunotherapy approaches combined with local regional therapies in patients with local disease. So Mark, I'd like to bring you in now and start talking about patient Greg. Greg is a patient with intermediate HCC. He's 62 years of age and presents to your clinic with Barcelona Clinic B, intermediate stage HCC. He's got good liver functions. His performance status is good, zero. He's got multifocal disease, as you can see on the scan on the right-hand side. One lesion's about five centimeters, one's about four, one's about three. And he wants to explore aggressive treatments. He wants to do the best thing possible. What are your thoughts on this case, Mark? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think intermediate stage HCC is very heterogeneous. Um, and uh, right now, I think there are big discussions about which patients should receive local regional therapy versus which patients should receive systemic therapy. Um, and, and this is a goalpost that's sort of been evolving over time. But I think, you know, what you're discussing is the new concept of, you know, is there a role for combination approaches where we combine local regional therapy with systemic therapy? That's not a standard approach right now, but something that is being studied on on clinical trials and you know I think a patient like this who wants to be aggressive this is a young patient with preserved liver function um, uh, you know I, I think it certainly would be reasonable to offer uh, a sort of combination approach uh, of both systemic therapy and local regional therapy as part of a, a clinical trial and, and certainly that's something we would like to do here. So just to ask a couple of questions so local regional therapy in the BCLC B setting includes certainly chemoembolization as the gold standard. So is that something you might consider, Mark? And, or would you try to uh, enroll them in a clinical trial combining this uh, TACE or Y90 or whatever with an immunotherapy? Um, and so that is something that I'd like to ask. And then ultimately, I think something that comes up a lot is, what if this person has slight hepatic dysfunction? Say BCLC, sorry, say child pew B7, for example. What's your thinking along uh, if, if, uh, if that's the scenario you're confronted with? Yeah, I mean, I think the second um, part of the question is easier to address. You know, patients with HCC, as you've mentioned, really have two problems. They have a sick liver, and then they have HCC that comes out of that, um, that cirrhotic liver. And, and so they really do have two competing causes of mortality. And so, you know, whenever we see a patient with HCC, we always need to balance, um, you know, the tumor control aspect and uh, the cirrhosis aspect. And Particularly for a patient who has very borderline uh, sort of liver function, you know, a lot of the procedures that we're talking about or, or therapies we're talking about can really push patients over the edge into um, liver dysfunction and make their life shorter rather than longer. Um, so for a patient who's really borderline like this, you know, that's a patient where I would be particularly nervous about um, not only local regional therapies, but also some of the systemic options that we'll be talking about. Um, and so that's a patient where, you know, there may be consideration for immunotherapy alone, uh, where we have uh, some safety data, uh, at least for anti-PD-1 therapy with nivolumab. Um, there's some safety data for tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, for patients with sort of borderline uh, uh, cirrhosis. So, um, so, you know, those are options that um, we might skew towards in that sort of population. I don't know if you have thoughts about um, you know, taste unsuitability and, and where you draw the line uh, for a patient who's, who's a little bit borderline in terms of their liver function. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on in terms of what taste unsuitability is. But one of the things that certainly uh, uh, evolved, uh, Mark, is the, the notion of selective treatment. No matter the local regional therapy, you have to be very selective because, as you mentioned, you know, they have two conditions, the HCC and cirrhosis and hepatic dysfunction. So we have to make sure that we uh, limit any potential non-target exposure. 
So, so if this is not something that I can do and I cannot be selective, I will certainly defer to someone like yourself and consider systemic therapy because of the benefits that we've demonstrated in that patient population. I just want to close off this case here, and at least in, in assuming he was child pew A, uh, there's some work that's been done certainly uh, uh, by uh, many groups, but our group, we looked at looking at Y90 compared to chemoembolization, and we did a small randomized trial that showed that if TTP is what you're looking for, Y90 appears to outperform chemoembolization, and that is something that's relevant in the transplant setting. And so in this patient population, certainly uh, chemoembolization is reasonable. I think Y90 is also reasonable, uh, but this is, this is probably a, a discussion where local expertise, you know, makes a lot of sense. Mark, I'd like to invite you to start talking about the rationale now for combining these types of approaches, the local, regional, and the systemic therapies. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's both a clinical rationale and then a biological rationale. Uh, you know, the clinical rationale is that local regional therapy and systemic therapy really address different issues, right? The systemic therapy theoretically addresses extrahepatic disease, micrometastatic disease, may prevent uh, new lesions from developing. And local regional therapy addresses the areas of greater concern where you have large tumor burden that you need to address. So there, there may be some sort of clinical synergy. Um, the biological synergy is that um, local regional therapies can cause, uh, can cause an immunologic cell death. Um, tumors die, and that can be picked up from the immune system. So it's almost like you're creating a vaccine within the patient's own body. Um, uh, and, and, and so there are reasons to think that these approaches may not only be complementary, but potentially uh, even synergistic in some, some cases. The final reason is that um, there was a time where patients would receive lots and lots of local therapy, and then eventually um, their liver function would decline and they could actually miss the opportunity to receive some of the newer systemic therapies that we have. And, and um, one of the feelings that many have is that if you use systemic therapy earlier in the treatment course, um, you can uh, really prevent that uh, phenomena from occurring, get patients on effective systemic therapy earlier, um, and, and so that they receive more of the benefit of systemic therapy. So one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is how the intermediate stage has evolved. And, um, and right now there are a number of trials that I think are defining exactly what the role is of systemic therapy in intermediate stage disease. There are trials of local regional approaches uh, with and without the addition of systemic therapy, um, as well as trials of systemic therapy versus local regional therapy. And I think these trials will be very important to define um, exactly where uh, these treatments belong. Um, I'll just note that there are plenty of trials that have been done of uh, local regional therapies with and without TKIs. And in general, those trials have failed to show an overall survival benefit of early introduction of TKIs. Um, but uh, we now have more effective systemic therapy and immunotherapy works differently. It works very well for micrometastatic disease. And so there's a biological reason to think that the outcomes may be different for these ongoing trials here. And I'll just you know, add that in the old days, patients would move very linearly from local regional therapy to systemic therapy. But I think more and more, um, those of us who spend our lives treating this cancer understand that uh, these cancers um, are much better treated in a multidisciplinary fashion, uh, and there's more of a back and forth between local regional therapy and systemic therapy. So increasingly there's data that patients who access systemic therapy earlier uh, may do better, but also there's an increasing body of literature supporting the use of local regional therapy in more advanced stages of disease, um, including in the setting of uh, local progression while patients are on immunotherapy, as well as patients with really critical tumors uh, that need to be addressed local regionally. Uh, for example, patients with large portal vein thromboses. And I think that increasingly we appreciate that intermediate stage disease is uh, very heterogeneous and there are patients who should be treated with local regional therapy alone, systemic therapy alone, and then some patients who perhaps, um, at least on clinical trials, may benefit from the combination. Um, Different criteria have been established for who might benefit more from systemic therapy or more from local regional therapy. And one of the criteria that's been proposed is a criteria called up to seven criteria, which is essentially you add the number of lesions with the diameter of the largest lesion. Um, although I have to say that um, I, I don't 
ascribe to this uh, exact cutoff uh, in my own clinical practice. And I, I don't know, Ria, do you uh, do you follow this in your practice? Yeah, yeah, we don't, uh, Mark. I mean, I think I think uh, we're with you here. We still need to see a bit more evidence on that. There's a lot of these patients that could be downstaged, could be resected, uh, you know, could be benefited in different ways. So, so we look at this, uh, but it's certainly not something that we've adopted in terms of decision making. Yeah. I, and I agree with you. I think every case is unique, and, and really these cases should be seen in a multidisciplinary fashion. Agree. Um, so moving on here, um, this is a, a, a retrospective trial that was done that looked at the idea of which patients might benefit more from systemic therapy versus taste. This was done in an era where patients were receiving TKI therapy. Again, um, you know, now we're using more effective systemic therapy, so I think it remains... Uh, unclear whether um, this would look the same with our contemporary systemic therapies, but this trial um, proposed that uh, perhaps uh, patients who have this beyond up to seven criteria may benefit more from lenvatinib than from TACE. Um, but again, I think we really do need prospective trials to define exactly which patients should get systemic versus local regional versus the combination. And I think particularly interesting are these trials that are trying to compare systemic therapy head to head. Uh, with taste. I, I certainly am not someone who thinks that local regional therapy is going away, um, but it may be something that we use um, more selectively and perhaps is used more in the setting of in combination with local with systemic therapy or in the setting of progression. And then this is just something I alluded to earlier, but there have been many trials that have been done um, that have looked at um, local regional approaches with or without systemic therapy in an era where the systemic therapy was TKI therapy. And uh, I think what you can see here is that overall these trials um, showed that perhaps earlier introduction of TKI therapy can prolong progression-free survival, but none of these trials conclusively uh, showed any uh, benefit with regard to overall survival, which is why most of us would not use a TKI um, in, in the setting, in the intermediate stage setting. But again, it's quite unclear whether um, our, our immunotherapy-based uh, therapies would have an overall survival in this in this setting, and so um, I think that remains to be seen. You know, this is the idea of um, perhaps the next wave where we're we may be headed is the idea of combining local regional therapy with systemic therapy, um, not only taking advantage of the potential clinical synergy where the local regional therapy addresses the most critical area of the tumor. Um, because again, most of these patients get into trouble uh, when they have progression in critical sites like in their liver, which can be effectively addressed with local regional therapy. Uh, but also this idea that the local regional therapy could actually stimulate a tumor response against um, specific tumor neoantigens. Um, you know, this is something that's been shown in many mouse models. Um, uh, the idea that if you add local regional therapy, you enhance uh, immune responses to checkpoint inhibitors through something called an epscopal effect. I think this has been quite difficult to demonstrate in human patients. It's something we talk a lot about. Um, I think many of us believe that there's something here, um, uh, but, but it's been hard to show, uh, I think, clinically, um, uh, although something that we continue to look for as an explanation for why these therapies could be combined. Mark, I just wanted to add, if that's okay here, you know, there's yeah. treme obviously tremendous excitement to the idea of, of, of that internal vaccine like you mentioned, at least from, from my perspective in, in international radiology, we're excited at the, the, the prospect of either embolization or radioembolization or ablation or cryoablation, all of these things uh, representing tools that we could use to, uh, to, uh, to stimulate that immune system. So all of that stuff. So there's really a lot of opportunity here for research and advancement and to really, you know, benefit the, the patient population depending on their presentation. Uh, I, I completely agree with you. So this is something we've alluded to several times on the program, but there are many ongoing clinical trials that I think will potentially redefine how we use local regional therapy and systemic therapy in the intermediate stage. Um, this is one such trial, the DEMAND trial, which is randomizing patients to bevacizumab and atezolizumab with or without local regional therapy. Um, and the primary endpoint is, is survival. Um, but we also have trials that are looking at uh, TACE alone, uh, which of course is the current standard of care for the majority of patients in the, in the intermediate stage, uh, with or without um, concurrent immunotherapy, in this case, uh, 
dervalumab or dervalumab with bevacizumab. Um, and so uh, this is perhaps looking at the other side of the equation, which is, is adding systemic therapy earlier uh, uh, beneficial. And then there are other trials ongoing. This is a trial of, uh, of everybody gets local regional therapy, um, but with or without systemic therapy, in this case, uh, Dervatremi, so a CTLA-4 inhibitor uh, plus a PDL one versus Dervatremi plus lenvatinib, which is a multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitor, a quite intensive uh, triplet immunotherapy. So um, many different trials ongoing. This is not all the trials, but I think just gives a sense that there are trials of um, local regional therapy with and without systemic therapy, um, systemic therapy versus local regional therapy, and systemic therapy with or without local regional therapy. Um, so many different uh, trials ongoing, um, uh, trying to get at the, the heterogeneity of intermediate stage disease and, and potentially which patients could benefit from which modality or uh, modalities in combination. Getting back to the rationale for local regional therapy and, and immunotherapy, I think there's an increasing body of preclinical evidence that um, suggests uh, that these approaches can be combined and are at least complementary and potentially even, even synergistic. I guess the question is uh, for you, Riyadh, is just, um, you know, how would you describe the current state of, of clinical evidence and do you at least feel that these combinations are, are safe even as we're waiting for, you know, clinical outcome data from these larger trials? And what's been your experience with this? Yeah, Mark, I mean, the, reali the reality is, you know, we're always waiting for, you know, clinical evidence, the highest evidence we can get. But sometimes, you know, um, these take a long time to complete. Um, and in the meantime, we have hundreds of patients to treat over several years. So yeah. we have to take the best evidence we have at the time to make some clinical decisions. And I would tell you that, you know, for the longest time, you know, we were always worried about what happens when you combine an LRT with certain systemic therapies, et cetera. And by and large, you know, they, we've, they've demonstrated to be safe off trial now. This is just in clinical practice. And, you know, now more and more, certainly with our medical oncologists, we are performing the LRT that's indicated for the patient. And then, you know, a month or a few weeks later, they start on some type of systemic therapy. So to capitalize on the cytotoxic effect of the LRT and to capitalize on the TTP and the PFS and the OS benefit of the, of the immunotherapy to capitalize on, on the vaccine effect you described. So, so we are not seeing any toxicities that make us change that practice. Yes, of course, we're waiting for the highest level of evidence and, and, and we're anxious for the results. But in practice, in clinical decision making, there's no doubt that we, um, um, we are now, we've adopted these combinations because we've demonstrated them to be safe. And in fact, you know, we've done that. And just to co co complete the bottom of this comment here, Mark, is that 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 work, that combination, the collaboration, you know, uh, has spanned now the entire BCLC spectrum. We get biopsies now for NGS, et cetera. We do response assessment now, immune response assessment, m resist assessment. So that collaboration continues to expand. But it's really based on the fact that we can do these things and they are certainly uh, have been shown to be safe. You is that your observation? Yeah, no, completely. I we're lucky that we have clinical trials uh, to offer patients where they get combination approaches. But if patients are not candidates for clinical trials or don't want to participate in clinical trials, and um, you know they really do have a critical situation where they have metastatic disease, but um, you know, impending uh, issues in their liver. You know, I I, I certainly after long discussions with patients, would offer this in select cases. Um, and, and I think that there is enough evidence now that these combinations appear to be uh, safe. And, and in select cases, it's something I would even consider off of a trial. I, I agree with you. Um, you know, maybe we could just get into the weeds for a minute. And, and, you know, you're lucky to offer many different local regional approaches. You can do taste, ablation, uh, uh, you know, cryo, uh, Y90. Are any of these approaches you think superior in their ability to um, promote an episcopal effect with immunotherapy? What are your thoughts about this? Boy, that's a great question. I, I know there I was always a lot of initial enthusiasm on the ability of cryo to in incite that immunologic effect. There certainly has been some recent data showing that radiotherapy 
uh, certainly can play that role as well. Certainly a blade of radiotherapy as well. So quantifying which one is better able to, I, I'm not sure I can, I, I have an opinion at this point, but certainly that, that all of them or most of them are to some, ex, to some degree able to incite uh, that effect. And, and, uh, and maybe that's all you need is just to get, get the ball rolling. Uh, and it's not really, uh, the magnitude is not dependent on that initial insult. Uh, so I don't know that, that, I, that I can tell that one is, one is, uh, one is more effective than the other, but Certainly, there's, there's a lot of excitement with all those modalities. But let's take a look at another case, Mark. You, uh, you up for another case? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So this is, a, this is, uh, this is Phoebe. Phoebe is a 58-year-old uh, female with BCLC-A disease. So she has early disease, but it's a solitary large tumor, which is BCLC-A. Note uh, for the viewers that uh, BCLC-A uh, does not have a size, for solitary lesions, does not have a size limit. So technically, any lesion... Uh, that solitary is a BCLCA. In reality, however, when you get started getting to 10, 12, 14 centimeter tumors, you have microsatellites, so it's not solitary anymore, but just something to think about. Uh, Phoebe's got good liver function, good performance status. Now, she's non serotic, uh, Mark, so a little bit different. Uh, the BCLC algorithm is based on serotics, but she's got an alpha feeder protein of over 5,000. And so the first thing I'd ask, for you, ask of you is, um, how you'd manage this patient. Uh, are you concerned about the alpha fetal protein uh, and, and anything in terms of adjuvant immunotherapy you'd consider? Yeah, I have a lot to say in this case. I mean, this is a patient who, as you said, should be offered potentially curative therapy. Um, but we know that the chance of recurrence here is very high, you know, 70% or more in some series. Um, you know, the large tumor size, the high AFP certainly... Um, put this patient at higher risk of recurrence. Um, you know, right now the standard of care would be to do resection alone. Um, but, you know, there's not a single other tumor I can think about where we have highly effective systemic therapy where we're not using those systemic therapies to cure patients. And so, um, you know, I feel very strongly that uh, in the future we'll find a way to use our systemic therapies to, to cure patients. Um, I'll just note there are several clinical trials that are ongoing of adjuvant immunotherapy. Um, there was a press release uh, very recently that the addition of bevacizumab and atezolizumab in the adjuvant setting uh, prolonged um, disease-free survival um, for resectable HCC. Um, we have not seen those data yet, um, so uh, it's, you know this is not something that is a standard recommendation yet, but I think it's a sign of, of what's likely to come. Uh, in the near future. Um, you know, I, I think one of the big questions in our field is, um, do we give immunotherapy after surgery or do we give it before surgery, neoadjuvantly? Um, and uh, there are a lot of trials of neoadjuvant immunotherapy as well uh, in our field. And, and the data for that are, at least in melanoma, there's data if you give immun immunotherapy before surgery, um, you, you do seem to have a better effect um, with a significant decrease in, in uh, uh, disease-free uh, or, or, or in disease recurrence, uh, giving the same number of immunotherapy doses, but just shifting by two months so that patients get two doses before surgery. I think that's something that um, needs to be explored in HCC on trials. So I think we both agree, Mark. Uh, probably hepatic resection is, is the first thing you'd offer her, curative therapy. I would agree. So let's talk a little bit about hepatic resection. And in, and, in, and in general, when you think about hepatic resection, you know, there are guidelines that provide us information on the surgical guidelines in terms of, you know, who's a good candidate for resection. Uh, single nodules, of course, irrespective of size, is if you can perform uh, that resection with adequate future liver remnant and without clinically significant portal hypertension. And that's defined as hepatic venous portal gradient of over 10 millimeters of mercury. The other issue has to do with the presence of varices and, a, and thrombocytopenia and large platelets. So if you've got portal hypertension, this becomes a bit of a challenge. But in this case, in Phoebe's case, she does not have portal hypertension. She's got good liver function. And again, this is well within the guidelines. But as you mentioned, uh, resection is curative, but has a high recurrence rate. So this is the issue. And potentially that alpha feeder protein that was over 5,000 might be a bit of an issue for, for Phoebe. Uh, in terms of future liver remnant, that just uh, defines the amount of liver that's left behind. And when you do the math, in general, when you have a normal liver, no portal hypertension, you need about 20% left for, uh, to maintain liver function and life, of course. 
And when you're cirrhotic, you need more because the, there's intrinsic hepatic dysfunction. And so 40% with cirrhosis. But again, uh, we have a recurrence problem uh, where it's about 70% at five years. And again, look, thinking about what that means, it obviously depends on the baseline characteristics. So the more nodules you have, the higher the likelihood of recurrence. And this is data that was presented a long time ago. The larger the tumors, uh, the higher the likelihood of recurrence, the more complex the surgery, et cetera. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, whether you have margin or not, if you have um, a, a, a tumor full margin, then you're gonna have a higher rate of recurrence. So this was studied in STORM several years ago, the idea that you could perform a curative therapy, either resection or ablation, and then treat with serafinib. And that, that study failed to improve recurrence-free survival. This is in contradistinction to what you just mentioned, uh, Imbravo 5 uh, that was just where the, we haven't seen the data, but at least the announcement was made that it was uh, successful in extending uh, recurrence-free survival. So I think we agree that rec uh, resection is, is the best option um, uh, for Phoebe. Uh, obviously, uh, what the pathologists identify uh, at explant is going to be important, and the tumor microenvironment is very important. If I can have you, Mark, to tell us a little bit about uh, the, the tumor microenvironment in, in HCC. Well, you know, before we start splitting, let's lump and just talk about HCC in general. So HCC is a relatively immune-resistant tumor type. The response rate to single agent PD-1 or PDL1 is in a range of about 15%, which is quite a bit lower than, uh, you know, the sort of more inflamed tumor types like lung cancer or melanoma. Um, some of that is because HCC has a fairly modest tumor mutation burden. Uh, so we know that the more mutations a cancer has, uh, the more um, abnormal proteins the immune system can recognize and attack. And so that has something to do with uh, the response rate um, to anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-01. Um, some of this has to do with just the liver itself likely being an immune-resistant uh, tumor microenvironment. We know that other tumor types that are metastatic we tend to see the liver mets uh, respond better than the liver, I'm sorry, the lung mets respond better than the liver mets. So there's something about that liver milieu that, that also probably confers some immune resistance. Now within HCCs, uh, we know that some HCCs are, are more immune inflamed uh, than other HCCs. Um, exactly why that is, is, is unclear. Some of it may have to do with uh, tumor genetics. There's at least some research suggesting Wnt beta catenin mutations conferring some immune resistance, although that hasn't um, panned out in, in other prospective studies. Um, uh, we know that uh, PDL1 expression um, is is somewhat rare uh, in HCC compared to other uh, tumor types, and we see responses in PD1 positive and negative uh, to, uh, HCCs. So I think this is a, something that we need more research in, but I think overall HCC is a fairly immune resistant tumor. Um, and then this was mentioned, this is the I'm Brave 50 study um, looking at adjuvant atezobev in patients who um, are at high risk of recurrence uh, after resection for HCC. Um, and again, there's just a, a, um, a press release that this trial met its primary endpoint, but we haven't seen the data. You know, I think this, until we see the data, some of the obvious questions are, this is the combination of a Tezobev adjuvantly. Um, you know, the question is, do you really need the Bevacizumab or is this all the Atezolizumab? Uh, we know that Bevacizumab doesn't seem to have activity in the adjuvant setting in other tumor types. Um, so it's unclear when you give two drugs, which one is really conferring the, the positive uh, benefit. So there is a trial of adjuvant uh, Dervabev um, uh, and, and this trial is randomized, so it's Dervalumab with or without Bevacizumab. And I think this trial will really answer, is checkpoint inhibitor alone uh, what we need, or do we really need the combination with Bev? So, you know, time, time will tell. I think this is also a very important study that I look forward to. Um, you know, one, one thing to know is the I'm Brave 50 study, that's the Bevatezo study, had a, a somewhat higher risk population um, patients with multifocal disease or macrovascular invasion. Um, Emerald 2 uh, has a, perhaps um, a, a less um, uh, high risk of recurrence population. So, um, so there will be differences in the patient populations between these studies. And it'll be interesting to see whether it's only the highest risk patients who benefit or whether this is really across the board that this is something patients should get.
you know, again, we haven't talked much about transplant, um, but we know that, uh, that liver transplant is a great option for a subset of patients uh, because you cure not only their HCC, but also their underlying cirrhosis. Unfortunately, we don't have enough livers for everybody, uh, so we have strict criteria for who can be a, a liver transplant candidate. Um, uh, and, and Riyadh, anything you'd, you'd want to add here? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the evolving narratives in, in the transplantation setting is the use of IOs in a patient that may potentially uh, go on to liver transplantation. What, what are your thoughts on that? Because that would be something you would do, and then that patient would come back to our tumor board to see whether we yeah. transplant. But what are your thoughts on that? What are you guys doing at Hopkins? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's good data that patients who already have a liver transplant, um, you really generally don't want to give an immune checkpoint inhibitor because the rate of rejection is, is unacceptably high. I think the converse is more complicated. So if you have a patient who is on systemic checkpoint inhibitor therapy, has a great response, is downstaged, uh, and is now a transplant candidate, do you feel comfortable giving them a new liver after they've received immunotherapy? Especially because the half-life of these drugs is, is very long, a month or more in some cases. You know, I, I think the available data, um, the largest series being from Mount Sinai, suggests if you wait about three months from the last dose of checkpoint inhibitor, in most cases you can, you can get away with giving a liver transplant without much rejection. But this is a small series, very little data, and, and something we, we, we certainly do, but cautiously. Yeah, certainly there are, there are, there are forces that, that sort of make us uh, perform certainly LRTs in that patient population, but also uh, we've seen a lot of examples where potentially the systemic therapy might downstage that patient as well. So there is some interest in that. Sometimes access to the local regional therapy is limited. The blood supply may be challenging. You know, for me, yes, of course I can do LRTs, but I need a blood supply that goes to a lesion. So there are technical challenges that exist with some LRTs and, and that opens up that possibility of, well, what about a systemic therapy that might potentially uh, you know, be used in that downstaging setting. I know there's some work that's been done with Emrysys to try to downstage using systemic therapy. I still think that data is relatively immature, but it's certainly an interesting concept to look at. Yeah, and, and this is going to be studied um, prospectively, actually. So there's a trial of dervalumab and tremolimumab, again, a, a single dose of a CTLA-4 inhibitor plus a PDL one inhibitor um, uh, prior to liver transplant. Um, in this trial, they're giving a 72-day washout from the last dose of immunotherapy um, uh, because, you know, again, the concerns of the long half-life of the checkpoint inhibitor, and at least with a couple of half-life here, uh, you know, perhaps the risk of rejection will go down. Um, so this should really answer the question in a, in a prospective way. So maybe, Mark, we can talk a little bit now about um, transitions. And this is an important topic certainly for the listeners and, and in general for us as practitioners is, as you mentioned before, uh, historically it's been pretty linear. We do LRTs until, until pretty much there's hepatic dysfunction. There are a few treatments available. But now with the, with the advent of a lot of treatments, you know, myself and other practitioners that perform LRTs, one of the things we have to be cognizant of is liver function and to permit the proper transition of the patient from uh, an LRT to a systemic therapy to allow that patient to benefit from these treatments. There are too many good treatments available now that, that this is, has become sort of top of our list now when we perform uh, local regional therapies. And so when you think about, about um, this patient here, so let's take a look at, at another patient here, Mark, and interested in your, in your input. So this is a patient, uh, David is 60 year, 66 years of age. Uh, he received a taste for local regional uh, disease. And um, you asked me a little bit earlier on about um, uh, uh, incompatibility or unsuitability of embolization. I'll get, I'll get to that in a second. But basically, uh, he progressed on chemoembolization, now developed lung nodules. I think he had an elevated AFP, which is uh, uh, predictive of him developing uh, metastases. But certainly when you think about patients that are unsuitable or refractory, there are certainly a lot of organizations that have looked at this and why because uh, it's important to have some sort of guidance, some sort of guidelines to, 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 to help the practitioner know when to go from one modality to the other. And not everybody's going to have a tumor board, not everybody's going to have a mark or a READ on site to help with that. And as a result, you know, some guidelines are appropriate. And certainly things like a couple of treatments uh, that uh, proved ineffective without response, et cetera, 
is something to consider as, as a taste refractory or taste ineffective. The inability to get to the vessel because of parasitization or, or, or non-target deposition, you'll deposit in areas other than the tumor and maybe risk too much liver injury. Uh, and, and there are also some conditions that are quote unlikely to respond, you know, diffuse multifocal bilobar disease. That's not gonna respond to any type of local regional therapy. But certainly that's something that we've been, uh, uh, we've been thinking about in this, in this patient population. So, so, Mark, getting back to you in terms of David's option now, I taste him. Uh, I did my job. I thought I did a good job, but not good enough because he's now developed lung metastases. Uh, what are your thoughts now in terms of, of systemic therapy? I, I, I transferred him and, and sent him your way. He's still child PUA. I was very careful of that stuff. So he's, he's got good liver function and good performance status. So, so what are you thinking in your clinic for David? Well, first of all, I think it's helpful to loop back to the idea of combination therapy because, you know, those lung lesions are not a failure of your taste. They were probably there before you taste this patient. And, and these are the sorts of patients that make you wonder, should we be using systemic therapy earlier to address that sort of micrometastatic uh, disease? But, that, but that's a side note. So, um, so yeah, so this patient has now advanced stage HCC. Um, at this point, I think there's no question that they would benefit from systemic therapy. Um, we really have two regimens that um, that prolong life compared to our old standard of care serafinib, and that's the combination of atezolizumab, bevacizumab, or dervalumab and tremolimumab. Uh, so uh, a CTLA4 PDL1 uh, combination for dervatremi. Um, again, both of these regimens have overall survival benefits over our old standard of care serafinib. Um, they've never been compared head to head. And so, you know, for a patient like this with fairly aggressive disease, you know, progressing pretty quickly, you know, this is a case that I might lean more towards a Tezobev just based on those characteristics. But, you I know, mean, I think both a Tezobev and Dervatremi are, are, are certainly reasonable, appropriate uh, recommendations. Um, and again, although we've gravitated more towards our contemporary immunotherapy-based regimens, um, there are still patients who get TKIs in first line um, such as patients uh, who have contraindications to checkpoint inhibitors, patients with active autoimmune disease or, or you know, liver transplant, something we've talked about already. So a lot of options, exciting time to be treating HCC, um, much more exciting to be a medical oncologist than when I started when we all had just serafinib. Just to fast forward here, you know, this lists the evolving uh, uh, treatment landscape and you can see here, these are um, some of our systemic options on the right. Um, so I think in general, patients who are candidates for immunotherapy should be treated with atezobev or dervatremi in front line. Um, I think many of us continue to use atezobev as a preferred option, um, uh, especially because of the high response rate in PFS. Um, I think dervatremi is a great option uh, if a patient has a lower burden of disease where what you really care about is that tail on the curve. You know, if they respond, they respond for a really long time. And the tail on the curve on Dervatremi is quite impressive. Um, and then I think we really have no data for anything after Atezobev or Dervatremi. Um, uh, I think most of us would reach for a TKI in second line. Um, and, and, you know, this algorithm suggests a, a first line TKI like serafinib or lenvatinib. I also think a, a sort of traditional second line TKI like cabozantinib is, is quite reasonable after uh, bevatezo or dervatremi. Uh, again, we just don't, don't really have data. And, and for me, for after someone comes off of dervatremi, I would probably reach more for a first-line TKI because they're really VEGF naive. A patient coming off of bevatezo, you know, I think a, a second-line TKI is, is very reasonable. Um, and, you know, for all these stages, again, clinical trials are always a great option. Um, uh, again, it's amazing how much progress we've made in the last couple of years, and I'd like to think that some of our clinical trials um, are as much of a quantum leap uh, forward as what we've accomplished in the last couple of years. So this is data from the I Am Brave 150 study. Uh, this is the study that established bevacizumab and atezolizumab as being a preferred first-line therapy for patients. And what you can see here is that the combination of atezobev um, resulted in uh, not only longer PFS, as is shown on the, the right, but also longer overall survival, as shown on the left. The median overall survival in the study was 19.2 months. Um, interestingly, the serafinib also uh, performed quite well, 13.4 months, much better than we saw in older trials, probably reflecting just 
how our care has gotten better overall for HCC. And just to, to look at other secondary endpoints, so you can see the response rate for atezobev is up to 30%, um, much better than uh, the serafinib at 11%. And for the first time, we're starting to see some patients with complete responses, um, uh, which is, again, you know, extremely exciting, 8% of patients achieving complete responses. Um, I, I have patients alive today on atezobev or just on watchful waiting uh, who got a Tezobev on the clinical trial of IM Brave 150, which is just amazing. Um, you know, in oncology, we often have this trade off where we have therapies that are uh, more effective, but unfortunately also more toxic. Um, in this case, a Tezobev was not only more effective, but also in general better tolerated than the serafinib. Um, so uh, there was actually quality of life metrics, and the quality of life was better for a Tezobev than serafinib. Um, and, and that's in part because patients didn't get the sort of diarrhea, hand-foot syndrome um, that, that patients get with uh, TKIs like serafinib. Um, you know, there, the one side effect that I think is worth devoting a little time to is the bleeding issue. Um, bevacizumab was developed as a single agent for HCC years ago, um, but that development was stopped because of an unacceptable risk of bleeding with bevacizumab. And so when bevacizumab was resurrected in combination with atezolizumab for HCC, there was really a lot of attention to try to select patients who wouldn't bleed with bevatezo. So all of these patients um, underwent a screening endoscopy uh, before going on the trial. Um, and, and varices had to be treated according to local standards of care before patients could go on the trial. And in spite of um, that requirement, there was at least some numeric imbalance with 7% of patients bleeding with uh, bevacizumab in, in the trial um, and, and a, a couple of uh, even fatal uh, bleeds with bevacizumab. So, you know, I, I think that patients who've had recent bleeds, uh, recent uh, strokes, um, these are patients who probably shouldn't get bevatezo and should be uh, using a different uh, first-line regimen such as Dervatremi. Um, and in general, uh, the FDA label says that all these patients should undergo uh, screening for varices within six months of starting a Tezobev. Um, and then, you know, the other frontline regimen that uh, I think is worth um, discussing is the combination of um, dervalumab and tremolimumab. Dervalumab is similar to the atezolizumab. It's a, a pdl one inhibitor. Um, and uh, tremolimumab is a CTLA-4 inhibitor similar to ipilimumab. It's a, a drug that um, primarily works on, um, on uh, CD4 T cells um, and is involved in priming an immune response. Um, and in this study that we're going to discuss, the, the Himalaya trial, um, th uh, this was a trial of serafinib versus pdl one alone versus the combination of pdl one plus CTLA-4. Um, and, and the primary endpoint was overall survival. There was another arm of the study with a different dosing regimen that was closed early, so really just three arms uh, move forward. Um, and, and this is the overall takeaway. So the combination of Dervatremi um, uh, showed statistically significant uh, improvement in overall survival versus serafinib. Um, and you can see that the Dervalumab by itself didn't quite meet statistical superiority over serafinib, but did, did show non-inferiority. And, uh, and, and just to show some of the takeaways here, you can see that the addition of CTLA-4 um, uh, does modestly appear to increase uh, the response rate to 20% from 17% for dervalumab alone. Um, but I think where you really see the curve separate, and I'm gonna go back, is in the tail of the curve. And you can see looking out at 36 months, there, there do appear to be more patients who are controlled on the Dervatremi arm than just the Dervalumab arm. And this is something that makes sense um, looking at the mechanism of action here. Um, so just to fast forward um, uh, in terms of uh, adverse events. So when you add in um, uh, Dervatremi, so when you add that Tremolimumab, you do see more immune-related adverse events with about 13% of patients having severe immune-related adverse events versus about 6% for the dervalumab. So it is, uh, it does add a little bit of, of toxicity, uh, but overall fairly well tolerated. Um, and then I just want to quickly touch upon the other dual checkpoint combination. Um, nivolumab and ipilimumab is approved in the second line in HCC after prior serafinib. This was a trial done at a time when all we had was serafinib in the frontline setting. And there is an ongoing trial of Nevo-Ipi in frontline uh, 
uh, the Checkmate 90W study. And so um, it's possible that in the future we'll have more than one uh, checkpoint inhibitor option uh, uh, alone in, in the, in the frontline setting. Um, so just to fast forward here a little bit, you know, what are my take-homes for first-line HCC? Um, so in the advanced setting, we now have two regimens that um, improve survival over uh, TKI therapy, and that's a Tezobev uh, or Dervatremi. And so these are the two preferred regimens. Um, you know, how do you choose between them? A Tezobev appears to have a higher response rate, appears to have better PFS, um, but does have side effects, including bleeding that make it um, uh, uh, an unacceptable regimen for a lot of patients. And so patients who have varices um, uh, or a particular high risk of bleeding should get Dervatremi instead of Bevatezo. And then um, I think there are still patients who are candidates for single agent PD-1 or PD-L1. Um, this is something I would consider for patients who really are borderline for therapy, um, have a sort of child pub B HCC where you're particularly nervous about side effects where uh, perhaps a single agent PD-1 or PD-L1 would be reasonable to consider. And then I do think that TKIs continue to play an important role in the frontline setting uh, for patients who can't get checkpoint inhibitors for whatever reason. Um, uh, for example, patients who recur after a liver transplant uh, or have severe autoimmune disease and are on immunosuppressive therapy, uh, either lenvatinib or, or serafinib remain reasonable options for these patients. Um, and for patients who get checkpoints in frontline, Certainly, TKI therapy remains uh, an appropriate second-line therapy, so the, the treatment regimens are, are just evolving. Um, so let's uh, fast forward to the future here. So, so um, Riyadh, I'll, I'll turn this over to you since I know this is something you've worked uh, on for a very long time. Yeah, Mark, clearly there's been a lot of advancements uh, in the systemic therapy side, uh, and you guys certainly have the advanced um, patient population handled. Uh, we don't want you guys to have a complete monopoly on it uh, because maybe there's some potential uh, opportunities for local regional therapies to augment the effect in the advanced setting. And this is a uh, the launch trial here that was uh, recently published uh, that looked at adding a local therapy in the advanced setting. And, and you're right, early on in, this, in the session, you talked about, you know, if you have a large liver tumor and minimal extrahepatic metastases, maybe there's a rationale here, even though it's advanced, to really deal with the large liver burden, which will be the cause of the patient's demise, probably, as opposed to small extrahepatic metastases. And so this is a 300-plus patient uh, clinical trial that was uh, published, adding chemoembolization uh, to lenvatinib, so a new concept, adding a local therapy in the advanced uh, patient population. And uh, interestingly, this study was positive, with a very impressive uh, hazard ratio, a 57% reduction in risk of death. So OS improved from 11 and a half months to nearly 18 months. And the PFS improved from six and a half months to 10 and a half months. So 50 plus percent risk reduction uh, by hazard by hazard ratio assessment. So a uh, very interesting uh, outcome. The fact that maybe in this patient population, adding a local regional therapy, if properly selected, right? These were large tumors, PVT, uh, the, 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 the worst of the advanced patient uh, population probably, but maybe we can augment that, that, that outcome by adding a local regional therapy, again, based on the description that you provided early on in this, uh, in this session. Now, also, as you mentioned, uh, with more treatments, with more effective treatments, maybe with uh, more uh, challenging treatments comes an adverse event profile. It's a little bit different. So chemoembolization will be associated with pain and discomfort and nausea, et cetera. So it's not surprising that the combination group had, had uh, increased adverse events. That's to be expected, but with that adverse event profile comes a benefit in PFS and a benefit in overall survival. And it's up to us as clinicians to decide whether that benefit is worth that uh, added, um, added adverse event profile. And that's something that we think about uh, all of the time. When you think about um, starting to close off our session uh, for tonight, um, certainly the HCC um, patient journey is dynamic and spans all specialties, right? Again, in the last 10 years with the advent of serafinib, now medical oncology is an integral part of managing patients with HCC. Uh, most of the practitioners, we have to understand all the tools that we all provide. We have to be knowledgeable and well-read on all of these topics. And it is at the multidisciplinary discussion where all of these exchanges and this information is really uh, exchanged and, and outcomes are optimized. And as I mentioned before, repeating this important point that when we all work together,
um, we will improve outcomes. We will know when to transition from one treatment to the other. We will know when to look at liver functions. We will know about technical feasibility and not. We will learn uh, from uh, each other's um, successes and failures in clinical trials and real world evidence, et cetera. So again, I just think that working together with guys like Mark and, and others um, is just improves that, that, uh, the outcome for that patient and it allows us to individualize patient care because at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. Any closing thoughts, uh, Mark? No, I, I totally agree with you. You know, obviously we've had a number of breakthroughs in systemic therapy for HCC. And, you know, I think with this, it's more and more important that uh, oncologists work with the other members of the HCC team. You know, we definitely want to see patients earlier. Um, we want to make sure that we're able to treat patients before their liver function declines. Um, but, you know, when when some of these newer regimens came out, I had a good friend of mine who's an interventional radiologist who called me and said, you know, are your systemic therapies getting so good that I don't really have a role anymore? And I said, you know, it's just the opposite. I think as our systemic therapies get better and patients are living longer, there's going to be more and more of a need for local regional approaches to address oligoprogression, critical tumors. Um, and, and so I view it as just the opposite. I think the partnerships are just beginning Obviously, it's a very exciting time with all these, uh, you know, intermediate stage trials that are going on that will potentially redefine how we think about intermediate stage HCC. Um, but until de until then, you know, I think each of these cases should be seen in a multidisciplinary team uh, fashion and uh, with with people working together the way that you and I work with our colleagues at at our respective institutions. So, um, you know, I think today was a great discussion and uh, a lot more to look forward to here. Yeah, Mark, exciting times. It was great discussion having with you. I think we have uh, some uh, audience Q&A, and I think we can start uh, discussing that a little bit here. Um, it, uh, let's, let's take a look at these real quickly and see if there's anything uh, we can handle. So one question is there about the sequential treatment of systemic therapy and LRT in advanced disease. We talked about launch. Uh, so that's, that's there. There's a role here. There's a clinical trial. It's mostly uh, hep B patients in that clinical trial. So We'll have to be careful and cautious to how we interpret that, but certainly there's some data on that. What about uh, what about SBRT and combining with some of these IOs, uh, Mark? What are your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, there's a study from um, from China that that showed that the combination of TACE for the intrahepatic portion plus radiation to the um, portal vein thrombosis provides better overall survival than serafinib. Now, we're not really using serafinib anyway in the systemic therapy world, but, you know, I, I do think that, there, that SBRT is something that um, does have a role in the management of HCC. And, you know, I found it can be helpful, particularly for patients with very, very large tumors that um, surgery is not an option for whatever reason, or, or patients with portal vein thrombosis. Um, you know, and, and I think that in general, SBRT appears to be safe in combination with checkpoint inhibitor therapy. We do tend to hold the, the BEV. If you're giving a tezobev, we normally hold the BEV um, around the time of SBRT, uh, but the atezolizumab could be continued. What about, um, here's a question that's interesting down at the, the, the penultimate question. It talks about uh, patients that are candidates for systemic therapy over LRT in the BCLCB patient population. Are you happy with that uh, BCLCB classification to three categories now into sort of the worst ones, maybe the downstaging ones and the bread and butter intermediates? Are, are you happy with that? Do you think that needs a bit more refining or at least it's providing some initial guidance, which I think addresses this question here? Yeah, I mean, it's something we've hit on repeatedly in this program is that intermediate stage is incredibly heterogeneous. Um, and, you know, the challenge is we just don't know exactly where those uh, lines are where patients would benefit more from one approach than the other. And so I think the guidelines are kind of vague and, and maybe that's deliberate because we just don't know what to say exactly. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that they are vague because that's part of the individualized patient decision making. And, and, and I think I like at least it's beginning to recognize that heterogeneity. Frankly, I think advanced is also heterogeneous. I suspect, I predict, a substratification there as well, to be honest with you. But certainly in the intermediate setting, there's no doubt that there are some patients that are just out uh, of the A's and can be downstaged to A's and transplants, and those that are just about to become advanced, right? And so there's no doubt right. that they're basically advanced, as you've mentioned several times, and then everybody else sort of in the middle. Uh, 
My issue is some of these um, numerical uh, parameters, like up to seven, that try to really categorize good and bad patients. I don't, I don't know that, that, that we're really there yet without more sort of genomic information, to be honest with you, because uh, um, I've seen some ag look, aggressive looking tumors that have responded well and some benign two centimeter nodules that have progressed extremely rapidly, right? So I think it becomes uh, extremely challenging. There's one question down there that talks about post Y90 regimen recommend for delaying progression. There's no data on this. Uh, the only, uh, you know, the only data that exists is I think in, in clinical trial format that is being investigated now. We don't have any data as to what to give Y90 after. Uh, but I, as I mentioned before in the uh, session, we as part of clinical practice now will perform Y90 and local regional therapies and our oncologists here will start patients on systemic therapy because they're so well tolerated uh, and because we want to, again, accept the cytotoxic effect of the LRT and the cytostatic effect and cytotoxic now, as you mentioned, Mark, effect of the systemic therapy and really benefit the patient uh, in response, duration of response, and overall survival. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, now that we have at least a positive press release with Imbray 50 with the potential benefit for atezolbev in the adjuvant setting after surgery, you know, the question is, will we start to extrapolate these data to forms of local regional therapy like Y90. And, um, you know, I, I think, again, it would be great to have more data, but it's something that I think many of us will at least consider. So thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us. Thank you to Mark Yarshawan. It's been a pleasure um, speaking with you tonight and learning more about HCC and, work, and learning about how we can collaborate. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash WEZ860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca.